outer appearance of a work, or is there a deeper meaning? And what is the common thread connecting all art? Arts Thread, an East Carolina production. Hello, and welcome to Arts Thread, the show where we explore different interpretations of art and how they all connect together. I'm your host, Joelle Banjo Johnson. Joining us today, we have Hannah Gibron. He is the sculpture professor at East Carolina University. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to be here. Thank you. Um, so let's get started. Tell us about yourself and what exactly it is that you do. I'm a professor of sculpture here at East Carolina University. I've been teaching here for the last 15 years, sculpture. Uh, <clears throat> with my work, the way I teach, the way I practice, I believe in both uh, two things. Give my 100% to my students, give my 100% to the community in terms of sculpting. The relationship between teaching and sculpting is to teach what I preach. Right. And uh, so during my teaching, I'm not just teaching my students, but I travel around the world. I've been in Argentina, Mexico, Costa Rica, uh, Germany, Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Israel. And where I grew up, I grew up in Galilee. And I bring a lot of package with me from being up in the mountain. And what you see in terms of my work, uh, the crystallization and formation, and the influence of my background and my sculpture exists within these pieces that you will be see later on. Okay. Uh, so the balance between teaching and communicating with the students, I'm trying to create a balance where wherever I go, I'm become ambassador to my country, ambassador to my university, and I bring these techniques both to the school as well as take these techniques that I have been teaching and I teach it at these symposium and conferences throughout the world. Hmm. Uh, the end result for me is uh, my students. I want to <coughs> see my students, how they are the upcoming uh, youngsters that, that become the professional. And I would like to see him maturing. And to see him mature, I have to bring an international community an international experience to them as well. Okay. So we're going to take a look at some of those gorgeous sculpture pieces that you've created. Okay. So let, let's take a look at that. A pile of stone may not look like much to the untrained eye, but to world-renowned sculptor Hannah Dubron, it is the beginnings of art. Hannah has made a career of taking rugged materials, such as rock, wood, and various metals, and turning them into stunning sculptures. His work has been displayed all over the world, from Mexico to Finland to right here in North Carolina. The majority of his work is done in his home studio, where he is constantly working on a number of pieces. Though most sculptors use wax to cast molds for their sculptures, Hanna has developed his own method by starting with a block and marking out an idea for the piece, casting it, and using a saw to cut away negative space. Using this process, rather than the more traditional ways, allows Hana to use only his imagination and eliminates reliance on an unchangeable mold. Hana uses a variety of tools when creating his sculptures, several of which can be found at any hardware store. Other tools, however, are specially ordered for artistic purposes, using materials such as tungsten and even diamonds to cut the different media used for the sculptures. An obvious influence on Hana's work is nature, incorporating both the micro and the macro of the world. Hana's art encompasses everything from the structure of a cell to the geography of our entire planet. Okay, welcome back. Sculpting is definitely an interesting um, art. Uh, take me through the creative process. W what do you do to get, you know, when you start sculpting? Explain that process to me. Well. Uh, my creative process is an incubation of ideas that I either have been sitting on it for a long time or as was inspired my, by my surrounding, uh, by nature. Mm. Uh, for example, some of these pieces that you will see, the crystallization and formation. Uh, I lived in Milwaukee for a long period of time, and during the snowstorm, I used to see the crystal grow on the glass. Wow. I actually sit and watch it. The same thing where I grew up in Galilee, we have a lot of geod. And I used to split these geodes, which is their spherical form, and you see the inside. So my work, actually, the way I look at it, in a, sim in a sense, is like a human body. You look at it from the inside to the outside. The same thing. I, the idea starts from working on the micro to the macro. Okay. 
okay. uh, from the universal to the ordinary as okay. well. And these forms and these patterns that I utilize in my sculpture, actually, it comes from nature and goes back to nature in that sense. And the reason why I cast them in iron in some, right. of, the, some of the work, because I like the fluidity of the iron and the weight of it and the color. And it's such a natural process that I feel when you smelt and melt the metal, it flows so gently, so fluid, mm. uh, that penetrate and enter every uh, crevice, every corner in the sculpture. And usually it does not require a lot of finishing. Okay. Because the process that I use, actually it's my own invention, my own innovation in a sense of the process of the mold making process and casting, uh, which is not that many people use it. Mm. Uh, we use the what we call it the lost wax process. I don't use the lost wax process. The process that I use is utilizes direct cutting and carving into the mold itself, the sand mold in that in particular. Okay. And actually that's I've been doing this process for over twenty years. Wow. And developing it. So that's why when I travel around the world it's and do this work, these workshops, become an inherent factor that this is my own process and procedure. That, you uh, do. that I do because it's everybody's surprised with the end results right. and the complexity of the work. So you talked about um, the iron and you know, how easy it is to, to sculpt the iron. Are there other materials that you work with as well <coughs> or do you just prefer to do the iron? Well, uh, I have a different bodies of work, what I consider. I enjoy carving. I have done many uh, granite and uh, yeah. marble large scale work. When we talk a large scale, about 10 to 12 feet in height wow. pieces, as well on a small scale, 12 inches. So I don't have a preference to the material. My preference is to create and make a sculpture. Okay. So I do a lot. Of, I've done many stainless steel sculpture, steel, wood carving, uh, fabrication, uh, different material. I combine bronze and stone marble and other stone together. Right. I combine my iron pieces with stone pieces. So I do have a combination. I'm trying not to limit myself in terms of uh, experiencing the material as well as experiencing uh, the creative process in a sense. Mm. You can't, I don't want to limit myself. I'm an artist. So if I feel like painting my work tomorrow, I do my painting. If I feel like uh, drawing, I should be drawing. So you combine the other art forms such as drawing and, and, and painting and that's sure. part of the sculpture process. Well, I mean, when I apply patina or patina on my surface, oxidation the surface on the bronze pieces, I'm, I'm applying a surface design, a surface element. Hmm. And that is through the oxidation of the material, the, uh, through the oxidation. Or for example, if there is rust in one side and another side is uh, apply blue patina. So that's basically a color. Okay. And people sometimes they, try to separate between painting in a sense of painting, which is an illusion, basically. <laughs> We're creating with paint. Uh, depends on the material that you use versus oxidation of the surface, which I can use like a, almost like a paint or enameling. Okay. And as, as a sculpture, you know, art is definitely evolving, especially now with the, with the digital age, everything hitting. Do you think that s sculpting is one of those things that will truly stand the test of time because it does pull in so many different art forms? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, we I just came from a conference. I was in Alabama, and we were talking about digi digital artwork and hmm. the different. Uh, I've been digi doing digital artwork for beginning. It's my joke. Uh, beginning of time, I'm doing my digits. <laughs> so I've been using it for a long time. But I can see your point. Art evolve and art and technology is always since the beginning of time been yep. parallel to each other uh, between the science and the arts and between the experience of the scientists and the artists. The artists are uh, very intrigued by different processes and different techniques. And that's not going to stop me as long as the creative process does not stop and where I use the tools of the computer or somebody else's tools to manipulate the image. Hmm. What will happen when the computer shut down? Are you going to continue to be creative? I guess. Or, <laughs> yes, are you going to stop being creative as an artist or you wait until the power goes on? Hmm. So to be able to be, uh, I, see, I see myself as an artist, I should be able to produce, continue to produce 
regardless of the Absolutely. material, regardless of the technique. If I, you know, for example, I use one concept to my students when we were in Costa Rica. We were in the jungle in the middle of nowhere, which at some point we didn't have power. Right. So what do you do? How do you create? So we gather bamboo, we gather branches, we gather stone, and we figure out a way to be expressive and create some artwork. Wow. So that's where I see the creative process. Yes, it depends on the technology and the place. Uh, but I want, you know, to go into digital, uh, into cyberspace, is that an actual or virtual? Hmm. We have a, usually a discussion once a while. Some people want to co consider it three-dimensional. I consider it as a virtual. It's not real yet. Yeah. Real, I'm in interested in the tactile quality and the texture and the color and the warmth and the coolness of the surface and the object itself. Okay. That's where I consider it three-dimensional. Otherwise, as long as it's in, the, in cyberspace, it remains there. Virtual. Hmm. So how do, you, um, how do you inspire your students to, to, to get this mindset? And you talked about going to Costa Rica and gathering um, things of nature to create that art. Um, and the, how, do you, how do you translate that same motivation that you have for sculpting to, to your students? Well, that partially how we can translate it is by uh, allowing the students or encouraging them to enter competition. Hmm. Uh, for example, we just had a competition for our students, and that's, I say, going back and connecting with my community, with our community, immediate family, I call it. My immediate family and community is Greenville, Grimesland, Little Washington, New Bern, Rocky Mount, and Goldsboro. And these towns, they have what we call a sculpture competition or sc uh, competition, art competition. Okay. By me entering this competition and encouraging the students to participate in, and once in a while, one of them or two of them, you know, uh, get into the exhibition sculpture, yeah. as well as receive awards. The, these competitions, they have awards, 200 500 600 dollars. So that gives them a chance to say, well, I must be good. So <laughs> uh, by me entering this exhibition, which is on the same level as the students, so that gives them an encouragement. Absolutely. At the same time that we created a competition for New Bern Airport recently, where it created a competition and an exhibition for one year. So the students applied such as like a commission. Okay. So there were 17 participants. We had 17 models. Out of the 17, we juried eight sculptures. And these eight sculptures, each students received a stipend to purchase the material, which is made in steel, most of them, uh, to produce this piece up to about eight feet, nine feet. Wow. And then with me, with my help and the other people help, we took the sculpture down to New Bern. We did the installation and opening reception, and that was the greatest thing for the students in terms of creativity, competitiveness, and end with the results. I believe it. At the same time, when they see me active as an instructor, when I bring, for example, other sample, other pictures, and introduce him to other artists that I bring to school as a visiting artist, and the other artist actually speaks about me, for example, they see where's the potential for them right. and what kind of experience they are having. So there's more than one corner to be educated. Right. And that is, I love teaching. And because I love teaching, that's why I'm saying as a teacher now, as long as I can service the students, this is my goal, to help the students, to see some of these students succeed and beyond me and go beyond my Carry that legacy. Carry a, yeah, my, not my legacy, but the legacy of art and educate the community. Absolutely. And exhibiting in the community, it's our greatest goal because uh, the way I look at it in terms who's who's the most important people to educate and surround the community, and then I go to the outside or try to balance it between international, national, and local. What are some of the exhibitions that you have going on right now? Well, I just had a show. Uh, at Durham Art Center, okay. one person show. I had last year at this time, about March of last year, uh, at the library. Okay. I had a hunt in celebration of the 100 year celebration or centennial of ECU. I had a 100 sculpture with a catalog. Wow. I have right now another show 
in Kinston, one person outdoor show. I have another one in uh, Florida, another one person outdoor sculpture show in Lakeland, Florida. Okay. Uh, and I have about 15 outdoor sculptures scattered from Tennessee to Virginia to North Carolina to Wisconsin. Uh, so I'm planting my work throughout. And again, spreading that art throughout the community. Exactly. And continue on. Correct. I, I, sometimes, again, you, you talked about your main job is to be a professor. Um, I, do you get charged with uh, doing other sculptures as well for the community? Like if someone come out, like, can you build a sculpture just for Greenville? Does, does, do those things also happen as well? Well, uh, yes, that happens sometimes, but we have to separate sometimes if I want to exhibit this for on a temporary basis, yes. If it's a commission, then they have to take a different route, different direction. Okay. Why? Because it's involved time, material, and at the same time, uh, you know, there is a price for everything. Uh, of course. And if I'm, me and my wife, we formed a, a what we call a company, an arts, a GNH Studio Corporation. She's an artist. She's a sculptor herself. So we collaborate on that. She's the. She. We are. We are in business of creating sculptures. So that's. If at one point I decide I'm not teaching anymore, I have. My that. activity as a sculptor and continue to grow as an artist. Wow. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you coming here. Thank you for giving me this opportunity again. Appreciate thank it. You. That concludes the show. Join in next time.